How God Deals with His Covenant People Who Are in Rebellion Jeremiah 22, 21-22 I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your practice from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. The wind will sweep away all your shepherds, and your lovers will go into captivity. Then you will surely be ashamed and humiliated because of all your wickedness. Ezekiel 8.18 Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. Habakkuk 1.2 How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Isaiah 1.15 so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Jeremiah 11.11 11. Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster on them which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. Jeremiah 11.14 Therefore do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not listen when they call to me, because of their disaster. Proverbs 1, 24 through 32. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof so they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. 1 Corinthians 11:27 through 31 Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. 1 Peter 4.17 for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Hebrews 12, 25 and 29. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. For our God, is a consuming fire. Letters to the Churches Revelation 2, 14 and 16 But I have a few things against you. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 2, 2 21 I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Revelation 2.22 Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. Revelation 2.23 And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Revelation 3. 3. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, 
and you will not know at what hour I will come to you, literally, come upon you, judgment. Revelation 3, and the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth, literally, those who make earth their home. Revelation 3, 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. First reference, warning to Israel that the land will not spew you out should you defile it, as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people. Leviticus 18, 28, 29. These are all warnings of God's judgment on his people of weakness, sickness, and death. These are not warnings to believers of losing their salvation. They are warnings of the loss of inheritance and reward. Lives cut short before finishing the course. Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. And so I'll pick up in Jeremiah 7, which is the famous temple discourse. In other words, this would be like a prophet standing in front of a church today, a church that would represent God's people. And his people are coming into the church to hear the word and to worship. Jeremiah was assigned to stand there and speak this word. And you can read that for yourself, Jeremiah 7, verses 1 to 15. Verse 13, and now because you've done these things, that is all the idolatry that has been going on, even while coming to the temple, you've been coming to church, but you've still been practicing idolatry. And now because you've done these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising early and speaking to the prophets, but you did not hear. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place which I have given you and your fathers, as I did at Shiloh, when the ark and everything was abandoned there by the Lord, I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brothers and all the offspring of Ephraim. Now remember that phrase, Ephraim, because we're going to look at one other passage in the prophets. As for you, Jeremiah, do not pray for this people. And do not lift up a cry or pray prayer for them. And do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. In other words, they crossed the line. God appealed over and over and over and over again. They did not respond. And they crossed the line. And God says, that's it. There is a point where you cross the line. Is that what's happened in our midst? We don't know, but we will know. We will know. We will know for certain. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? Remember, they're coming into the temple to worship while all this is happening. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough and make cakes for the queen of heaven, Semiramis, Diana, whatever, Ashtoreth in that culture. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me, to show utter contempt and disrespect for me. Do they spite me? Do they show contempt for me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves that they're showing contempt for? Their own shame? Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, you see. On this place. On man and on beast and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground. And it will burn and not be quenched. You can read on. And then you'd think, well, after having heard that from the Lord, that Jeremiah would be convinced that he is not to function anymore as an intercessory person. He's just to be God's mouthpiece. Jeremiah 11, verse 9. The Lord said to me, Jeremiah 11, verse 9, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah, among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to their iniquities. Notice, they temporarily seemed repented, but they've turned back to their iniquities. Jeremiah 11, verse 10. They've returned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I have made with their fathers. Therefore thus says the Lord, 
Behold, I am bringing disaster on them, which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. That's an abandonment judgment. That's an abandonment. God isn't just some mysterious God. He's a person. He's a person. And he makes decisions. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they burn incense. Well, God's not answering, so they continue to cry out to their gods. Well, then they'll go, because God won't answer, they'll go cry to the gods whom they burn incense in their idolatrous worship. But they surely will not save or deliver or rescue them in the time of their disaster. For your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah. As many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to the shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. Therefore, second time, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done many vile deeds? Can the sacrificial flesh take away from you? your disaster, so that you can rejoice. You can read it. And then Jeremiah 14. There's judgment. There's a drought on the land. He's appealing to the Lord. Verse 7. Although our iniquities, the twisted perversity of our sin, testify against us. Jeremiah 14.7. O Lord, act for your namesake. Truly, our apostasies have been many. We have sinned against thee. Jeremiah 14, verse 8. Thou hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress, why art thou like a stranger in the land, or like a traveler who has pitched his tent for the night? Why art thou like a man dismayed, like a mighty man who cannot save? Yet thou art in our midst, O Lord, and we are called by thy name. Do not forsake us. So he's appealing to the Lord this third time. And he's human. I mean, he's not like he's sinning against the Lord. So the third time, the Lord says, Okay, Jeremiah, you don't get it. I am in your midst. And it's going to be not like what you expect. Thus says the Lord to this people, Even so, they have loved to wander. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now, he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. That's called a visitation. That's a visitation. So he is in their midst, and this is what he's going to do. So the Lord said to me, it's the third time, do not pray for the peace, the welfare of this people. When they fast, what are they doing? Jeremiah 7. They're going to the temple. They're carrying on in their religious routine. And you see that in Isaiah chapter 1 through 5. They're still practicing religion. When they fast, I'm not going to listen to their cry. Why are they fasting? They're religious. When they fast, I'm not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer a burnt offering and grain offering, I'm not going to accept them. Whether I'm going to make an end of them by sword and famine and pestilence. The only response to something like that, a word like that, is humility and repentance. Hosea chapter 4. Verse 6, my people are destroyed. Notice, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. That's a decision. I will also reject you from being my priest. That is, the nation is to be a nation of priests among the nations. Since you have forgotten the law, that is the instruction of your God, I will also forget your children. And then, if you continue on, verse 15, though you, Israel, play the harlot, that is, you're not only doing that physically, but you're worshiping false gods, Do not let Judah become guilty, that is the southern kingdom. Also do not go to Gilgal in the north, or go up to Beth Aven and take the oath as the Lord lives. Since Israel is stubborn, that's the northern kingdom, like a stubborn heifer, can the Lord now pasture them like a lamb in a large field? Ephraim, now watch this, is joined to idols. Let him alone. That's an abandonment. That's an abandonment judgment. And then he speaks to those who are supposed to communicate the word of God to the people, the priests, in chapter 5. They're revolted against the Lord. They've gone deep into depravity, verse 2. I'll chastise all of them. 
And verse 3, I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the harlot. You worship the other gods. Israel has defiled itself. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. Think of that. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. For the spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not know the Lord. This is not a born-again knowing. This is a practical, experiential knowing that is demonstrated by a walk of uprightness. That's covenant language. Do not know means there is no intimate relationship with the Lord. Moreover, the pride of Israel testifies against him, and Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah has stumbled with them, the southern kingdom. They will go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord. Watch this. But they will not find him. Why? He is withdrawn from them. Abandonment judgment. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord. That is, they're in covenant violation with the Lord. Treacherously always has to do with violate or breaking the covenant with the Lord. For they have borne illegitimate children, mixed marriages and all that kind of thing. Now a new moon will devour them with their land. That is, from the time they would worship. It's a judgment. You can read through it. It's a tremendous indictment. I will just say this, that the only way that I can adjust to reality is by reading the prophets. The prophets are a barometer. Are we in sync with the Lord even in our generation? And when we see blow after blow, increasing blow upon this nation, as anybody cries out and says, why? Well then, why haven't you read the prophets? You wouldn't be asking why if you were living in that which represents God speaking to his covenant people by analogy, speaking to the body of Christ today, only back then it was his covenant people, through the prophets. If you're not making the connection, that's why you're asking why in the midst of disaster. So if we have multiple pronged, asymmetric strategies against this nation, multiple biological, chemical, or even nuclear things going off simultaneously in different cities, multiple attacks to whatever it would be, Black Lives Matter, which is a Marxist, communist-run organization, whatever the combination will be, it's considered asymmetrical warfare. It's not like the invasion of a top military force. That will occur first, break down the infrastructure, and then Russia will take care of the rest of it according to Jeremiah 15:51. There is no hope for America. We've crossed the threshold. And when did we cross that threshold? In the 60s. And the question is how many people are still praying for revival in America? It's idiotic. Now we can pray for a revival of the church in America. But when anyone prays for America is not connected with the God of Jeremiah, the God of Ezekiel, the God of the prophets. Who is Jesus Christ? We're not in touch at all. Completely out of sync. There is no political hope for America. But there is hope for that which will represent a remnant church rising up in the midst of disaster. And in that day of visitation, what the revival will look like is the fullness of the Gentiles coming to the body of Christ out of disaster. And that means all these Muslims that are coming to America, that may be the way that God chooses for them to be saved as a result of a remnant being revived. God help us to be in sync with not only the God of Israel is the God of the church and there is no difference. And the way God dealt with Israel as a people, he will not deal with the church any differently in terms of their actions, their apostasies. He deals with the same issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 10 because the Corinthians were coming to the Lord's table and they were in hypocrisy, they were living in sinful lives. He says, well, is this not the reason why some of you are weak? Weak, sick, and not a few of you are sleeping. In other words, you're dying the sin unto death. Sleep means you're a Christian. You're asleep, that's the term. In some of you sleep, you're dying. And that's because of what was going on in the assembly in their lives. And there are seven sins that lead to death. First John chapter 5, and I'm going to start with verse 14. First John 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, now watch this, committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, And God will give life to those who commit a sin not leading to death. 
there is a sin leading to death, I do not say that you should make request for this. In other words, when someone is involved in committing a sin that leads to death, you don't pray. I'm not going to listen to you. I will not listen. And what happened here recently, the discipline is occurred. This person is committing a sin that leads to death. So we don't have to be emotionally attached. We don't have to be pleading to God around this. The judgment has been there. It is now the choice of this individual. It's her choice. So we don't need to pray for those that are committing a sin unto death. That's what the Word of God says. We go by what the Word of God says, not what our emotions tell us or about how we think about things. It's irrelevant how we think about things. The only issue is, what does God think? And our thoughts, in alignment with His thoughts, and even if our emotions are not, our emotions are our soul life, and our soul life is not to dictate our choices. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that He should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. And we can pray for that. Amen.